board study session for the California Environmental Quality Act uh, to order. Uh, uh, for CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so that being said, will you stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we start with our discussion items, I would like to note that Mr. Marzano will be joining us from Hawaii, uh, and Miss Miss Burns will not be in attendance at this meeting. She has another obligation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Halani from Lozano Smith. Um, my name is Janae Lani. I'm a Lozano Smith, and um, the sort of idea for this presentation uh, came to me sort of at the last board meeting I attended in November, where um, the district's consultants discussed the school consolidation draft EIR and some of the workings of that, and um, some of the questions I heard from the board there um, were more about sort of the basics of the Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, um, and, and sort of what it means and what it does. And so this presentation is, is not about school consolidation. It is not about the draft EIR that is uh, currently up for public comment. It is a high level overview of CEQA, uh, what it is, uh, what it's meant to be, what is required, um, and what the process looks like from beginning to end um, just from a basic legal perspective. Um, this is a really not meant to be a technical discussion. Uh, that's why the district has consultants to work on that. They, are, uh, they went to engineering school and, and all that. Uh, I went to law school and I'm bad at math, and so uh, that wouldn't, you know, I'm sure I would get it wrong anyways. Um, so this, this presentation is really just going to be about what is CEQA? When does it apply? What are some of the exem exemptions and exceptions that apply? If there are no exemptions and exceptions, what, what do lead agencies do? Um, and then what does the public review process look like? Uh, this is not tailored to school districts. This is for all government agencies in the city of California. They all, when required to go through CEQA, act as lead agencies. Uh, and so uh, this really is a very high level overview of that process. Um, so if we can go a few slides in. Just to the, to the first tile slide, please. And one more. Perfect, thank you. Um, what is CEQA? Uh, CEQA requires public agencies to consider and document the environmental impacts of what CEQA calls projects, and we'll get to that definition in a second. Um, that they propose to carry out or approve. Uh, and so that is a one sentence that means a lot. Uh, CEQA is a fairly highly litigated piece of law. Um, and so what does that sentence say? CEQA requires public agencies to consider and document, uh, so that's one piece, the documents themselves, the environmental impacts of projects Again, the word projects has a very specific definition in the realm of CEQA that they propose to carry out or approve. Again, that distinction between carrying out, approving um, will also become important as you'll see in a second. Where an activity is a project, public agencies must perform the requisite level of environmental analysis unless an exemption applies. Uh, if we could go forward two, please. So CEQA is a series of statutes and regulations you'll find in the Public Resources Code and then in the 
uh, California Code of Regulations is adopted in 1970. Uh, it is designed to inform decision makers as to the, and the public as to the potential environmental impacts of proposed activities uh, and how those effects may be avoided or mitigated or where they may cannot be avoided or mitigated. Um, it requires that information and uh, decisions be informed and balanced. Uh, its purpose is not to slow down or stop projects, even though um, I think you will hear a lot of uh, detractors from CEQA say that what it does is slow down and stop projects, but that is not its primary purpose. Um, and it does not regulate project implementation through substantive regulatory standards or prohibitions. So once projects are approved and the environmental processes go through, it does not regulate project implementation beyond, for example, a mitigation monitoring program. Um, and so what does this all tell us? CEQA is not a tool for finding the best way to do something. It is a tool to ensure that when public agencies make decisions, those decisions are informed. Uh, and they're informed of the impa environmental impacts of those decisions. And that is the goal of CEQA. Uh, it is not to say that a project is fair or right or good or bad. It really is just to say, what are the environmental impacts of a particular project? How can you avoid them? Can you avoid them? And giving a public agency that information before making a decision about whether or not to approve a project. Next slide, please. So how does this process actually play out? First question, always. Is this a project? If you'll remember, we just said CEQA applies to projects, and so the first thing is always figuring out, is something a project? Um, if it is a project, is there an exemption from CEQA that applies? If the answer to that is yes, are there any, and this is where uh, people start shaking their heads and their eyes glaze over, is there an exception to the exemptions? Uh, because everything has to be a little more complicated than just straightforward, um, and if there is, not an exception to the exemptions, um, or if there is an exception to the exemptions, or if there is no exemption at all, do you conduct an initial study? And what does the initial study say? Based on what the initial study says, is an EIR necessary? Um, and those are sort of your big buckets of decision making when it comes to CEQA. Uh, and we'll go through each of these here in this presentation. If there are any questions, please feel free to stop me. Next slide, please. Uh, what is a project? Uh, CEQA is triggered by an agency's approval of a project, which is any activity which may cause direct or reasonably foreseeable indirect physical change to the environment. Uh, the, this word, project, is very broadly interpreted by both CEQA and case law. Um, it is any activity directly undertaken by any public agency, any activity undertaken by a person which is supported in whole or in part through contracts, grants, subsidies, loans, or other forms of assistance from one or more public agencies, and any act an activity that involves the issuance to a person of a lease, permit, license certificate, or other entitlement for use by one or more public agencies. So it's not only things that public agencies do. It is uh, activities that anybody can do that is supported by a public agency in some form or an activity that involves issuing a lease or permit uh, that is used by one or more public agencies. And so this really becomes a fairly fact-intensive analysis in figuring out what is a project. Uh, but like I said, that word is defined very broadly. Um, some examples of projects include uh, a community college's decision to close and remove a campus shooting range and to transfer classes to another range off campus, so they closed shooting range at one campus, moved the classes elsewhere. Uh, that was deemed a project because it had the potential to contaminate the environment, uh, and a community college district is a public agency for the purposes of CEQA. Um, when school districts unify or lapse, uh, those are projects as per CEQA. Uh, when annexation occurs because um, uh, through LAFCO or another county organization, those are considered projects uh, because they have the potential to result in foreseeable indirect impacts. Um, water credit transfers from a demolished building to a new structure 
was a project. So you can see everything from closing a shooting range to transferring water credits, all deemed projects under CEQA. That word is very broad. Things that have examples of things that are not projects, um, uh, a zoning exemption resolution passed by a school district to exempt high school stadium lighting from municipal, from municipal zoning and land use laws uh, was not considered a, a project because the resolution did not commit the district to a definite course of action. It just referred to 12 proposed projects that the district was contemplating. Uh, a resolution to form a community facilities district uh, was not considered a project uh, because uh, it merely involved funding issues and did not mean that development would occur due to the CFD. So each of those examples is a litigated case and a court decision. Um, this happens a lot. The definition of project changes constantly uh, and the facts are very important. So. You have a project, what's next? Go to the next slide, please. Exemptions. Um, and next slide again, please. There are four big buckets of exemptions. Uh, one is something is considered a ministerial activity. There are exemptions expressly, expressly set out in statute. There are then categorical exemptions that are set out in the guidelines. And then finally, what is uh, known as the common sense exemption. And um, we'll talk about each of these in more detail. But if you find that something you're doing is a project, the next question is, does it fall into any of these buckets? Um, examples of undertakings that might con constitute projects but may be subject to an exemption is the installation of a football stadium scoreboard, uh, roof replacement, uh, a Prop 39 energy efficiency project upgrade, an expansion of a parking lot. Again, the reason we say is maybe subject to an exemption is because all of these are somewhat fact-intensive analyses. We do need to look at the facts when it's a project. We need to look at the facts of whether an exemption applies. And so not every parking lot expansion will be exempt and um, not every um, energy upgrade will be exempt. It really depends on what is actually going to happen on the ground. And so whenever these projects come before public agencies, whether they are school districts or otherwise, these questions are the things your legal counsel will ask you, your consultants will ask you, is what is actually happening here? So to move to the first category of exemptions, uh, go up one slide, please. Uh, ministerial activity. So. The best way to understand ministerial activity is to differentiate it from what is called discretionary activity. Uh, ministerial activity is when you apply a set of standards to a set of facts and you don't take any sort of independent self-thinking, if you will, to say whether something is applies or not, right? You take, um, you have a set of ordinances and a set of standards and you have a, pro you have a project and that all you're saying is, yes, this project complies with this set of standards. You're not doing any evaluation whatsoever. Um, it involves only the use of fixed standards of objective measurements, uh, and the public official cannot use personal subjective judgment in deciding whether or how the project should be carried out. Um, this is uh, common examples of ministerial activities include um, car registrations, dog licenses, marriage licenses, uh, a building permit can be ministerial if the ordinance requiring the permit limits the public official to determining whether the zoning allows the structure to be built in the requested location. The structure would meet the strength requirements in building code and the applicant, applicant has paid his fee. So again, very little um, subjective analysis. It's very much, does this check the boxes, yes or no? Uh, that is ministerial activity that is exempt from CEQA. Discretionary activity is when is that which does require the exercise of judgment or deliberation uh, when a public agency or body approves or disapproves a particular activity. Um, so this is saying we're going to do some thinking beyond the established standards and make a discretionary decision. Um, there is this is not a black and white question of yes or no. This is a 
maybe let's see more than anything else. And so um, when items are presumed, so there are some items that are presumed to be ministerial, uh, business licenses, uh, approval of individual utility service connections and disconnections. Um, and so again, a business license, you look at a form, it meets all the requirements, you say yes, that's ministerial. Um, utility service connections and disconnections, you look at a form, you say yes, that's good to go. Uh, those kinds of projects, those are projects, but they're exempt under the ministerial exemption. Uh, and you might be thinking to yourselves, what happens when there are projects that are more complicated that involve both ministerial and discretionary activity? Those are not exempt and are subject to CEQA, at least under the ministerial exemption. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So the next category of exemptions are the statutory, statutory exemptions. Um, these exist in the Public Resources Code, um, and they include things like emergency repairs, um, action to repair, demolish, or replace facilities damaged as a result of a disaster where the governor has declared a state of emergency, uh, actions to prevent or mitigate an emergency, establishing or modifying fees, uh, issuing or refunding bonds under the Cal California Educational Facilities Authority Act, uh, so these are some common statutory exemptions. Um, and these, we look up, you know, you ask your lawyer, we look up the statute and we say, this is your project, here's the statutory exemption, this is how you're exempt. Um, that, is one cat, well, that is one bucket, and they're not to be confused with our next bucket of uh, exemptions. If you go for two, please. Categor categorical exemptions. Uh, these are found in the CEQA guidelines. There are 33 of them, uh, but these are a little more complicated. Um, there are exceptions to these exemptions. Basically, if you think you have one of these exemptions, that's not the end of the story. We need to do additional work to see if any of these exceptions apply to that exemption. Is there be, will there be a cumulative impact? Are there unusual circumstances and some others? So. Some common exemptions for school districts include um, minor alteration of public facilities, um, reconstruction of existing school facilities at the same capacity, uh, conversion of small structures, collect, collection of data or information that would not result in a disturbance to the environmental resources, for example, a feasibility study. Um, you know, so. Those are some common ex categorical exemptions and that you will find, if you ever go look them up, they're called class, class one, class two, class three, class four. And so, again, we go back to the first question of, is there a project? If the answer to that is yes, then we go to the next question of, is there an exemption? First thing, is it ministerial or discretionary? If it's discretionary, is there a statutory exemption that applies? If there's not a statutory exemption that applies, is there a categorical exemption that applies? If there is a categorical exemption that applies, do any of the exceptions apply? So what, did that, what does that mean? Is there a cumulative impact? Uh, is there a reasonable possibility of significant effect on the environment due to unusual circumstances? Uh, will there be a damage to scenic resources within scenic highways? Uh, is it a hazardous waste site? Uh, or will it have a substantial adverse change to historic resources? So if any of these factors exist, you may not rely on the exemption and you need to move on to the next step in the process. And so again, a very fact-intensive analysis. Um, is there a reasonable possibility of significant effect on the environment due to unusual circumstances? Uh, those are a lot of legal words that don't really mean much until you actually take the facts into account and apply those facts to your situation. Cumulative impact. Are you doing a series of projects that all added together will have a larger impact than originally, um, originally intended in the class exemptions? Um, so these are, CEQA, again, is about informed decision making. So there's a lot of question asking and fact analysis that goes on. So all through, you know, halfway through this, we've just been asking questions. Is this a project? Is there an exemption that applies? Is there an exception to the exemption applies? Which of the exemption applies? And if an exception applies, what do you do next? Um, 
The last exception we'll talk about is called a common sense ex exception. If we go up one more, please. The common sense exemption is that a project ex is exempt if it can be said with certainty that there is no possibility that the activity in question may have a significant effect on the environment. What does a significant effect mean? That is the substantial or potentially substantial adverse change on any physical conditions in the area. Um, and so when you were thinking about significant effects, we think, we think of things uh, like the impact on land, air, water, minerals, flora, fauna, ambient noise, and objects of historical or aesthetic significance. So this is sort of a catch-all saying, you've come this far in the process, you've decided, you, you found that your project is a project for the purposes of CEQA, there is, um, it is ministerial, uh, or oh, sorry, it is discretionary, so it's not a ministerial action. Um, there are no stat statutory exemptions that apply. There are no categorical exemptions apply. But after all of that, the thing you are trying to do, there is absolutely no way it could have a significant effect on the environment. And that's what the common sense exemption is for. Um, but again, as you'll see, this is a fact-intensive analysis. Because the question you have to answer is, that there is no possibility that the activity in question may have a significant effect in the, on the environment. And again, significant effect covers all those things I mentioned, land, air, water, minerals, flora, fauna, ambient noise, uh, historic and aesthetic significance. Um, so again, we have to go through each of those questions, answer each of those questions to figure out, does this exception apply? And if after all of that, you find that the exceptions don't apply, or you have an exemption, but there's an exception to the exemptions, or, or any of the, or there is nothing for you to lean on, and you have to move on in the process. The next step, if we go to the next one, please, is the initial study EIR step of it. Uh, the first thing to do is an initial study. An initial study is a report that analyzes significant or potentially significant environmental effects, potential mitigation measures, uh, the contents of initial study uh, often include a project description, uh, environmental setting, uh, potential environmental impacts, and brief explanations to support the findings, uh, mitigation measures for any significant effects, uh, consistency with plans and policies, and uh, the most basic thing, the names of the people responsible. Um, so what are things that... Um, initial study and EIRs address and think about and consider. Um, they consider aesthetics, agricultural resources, air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, geology and soils, hazards and hazardous materials, hydrology and water quality, land use and planning, mineral resources, noise, population and housing, public services, recreation, transportation and traffic, utilities and service systems. That's a long list of things. Um, and this is really about that initial step of, okay, there's not an exemption that applies, so how does our project impact these things? And these are all the things that CEQA considers part of the environment. Uh, so, you know, I'm not gonna go through the whole list again, but you know, there's probably about 15 of them. Uh, and the question is, what is the impact? There are also certain things, and again, to make it, you know, go back to the theme of CEQA making things more complicated than, than it maybe needs to be. Um, if certain conditions are met, an agency must find that there is a significant effect and prepare an EIR. Uh, for example, uh, if the project has the potential to substantially reduce the number or restrict the range of endangered, rare, or threatened species, then you move straight on to the EIR phase. Um, there is uh, no dilly-dallying in the initial study phase. Um, and the finding that an, so a project may have a significant effect is done in the light of the whole record. Um, when the following conditions occur, uh, the project has the potential to substantially degrade the quality of the environment, substantially reduce the habitat of a fish or life, wildlife species, caused uh, a fish or wildlife population to drop below self-sustaining levels, threatened to eliminate a plant or animal community, 
substantially reduce the number or restrict the range of an endangered species. Um, the project has the potential to achieve short-term goals to the dis disadvantage of long-term environmental goals. Uh, the project has possible, possible environmental effects that are individually limited but cumulatively co considerable. Uh, cumulatively considerable means that the incremental effects of an individual project are significant when viewed in connection with the effects of past projects, the effect of other current projects, and the effects of probable future projects. So this cumulative analysis, that word has come up a couple times, is really a way to ensure that public agencies don't piecemeal their projects to get around the impact analysis. So you take one piece of your project and you do it, and then you sort of, at the same time, run another piece of a different project, but really all of those things are one big project, and the reason you're breaking them up is to get, avoid the, get around the impact analysis. That is what that cumulative consideration implies and involves. Um, and last but not least, the environmental effects of a project will cause substantial adverse effects on human beings, either directly or indirectly. So to recap the initial study phase, we've come all this way. There's no exemption that applies. Your consultant or, the, or your public agency puts together a report uh, considering potentially significant impacts. However, if they find that certain impacts are going to happen, then those are mandatorily found significant um, and you move on to an EIR. But what if those items don't exist, right? What if you do your initial study and you find that there are no mandatory findings of significance? Uh, what's the in-between step? Do you always have to do an EIR? The, an the answer is no. If we go to the next one, please. So one of the things that is possible is if there are no significant impacts or all significant impacts can be mitigated, um, then what you can do is adopt either a negative declaration or a mitigated ne negative declaration. If a public agency can't answer any of those two questions in the affirmative, that is, are there no significant impacts or can all significant impacts be mitigated, then you move on to the EIR. But before you get to the EIR, um, you can do a negative declaration of the facts support it. Um, and this is really why the, one of the reasons why the initial study can be so helpful is because that will let a public agency know, do we need a full-blown EIR? Do we need to go, go through the whole process? Or do the facts find that there are no significant impacts and we can issue a negative declaration? Um, in order to issue a negative declaration, an agency must issue a notice of intent to adopt a negative declaration. With the ne negative declaration and initial study attached, there's a 20 to 30 day public review period. Uh, and then the lead agency will adopt a notice of determination on the negative declaration. Um, we note that as per the public resources code and the CEQA guidelines, um, Public controversy does not necessitate an EIR. It is really the facts of the impact that necessitate an EIR. And answering that question of, are there significant impacts? Can those impacts be negative, uh, mitigated? So say you've done your initial study and you find that there are impacts, um, and so you can't adopt a negative declaration, but you find that you can mitigate those. Uh, the other option available to public agencies is to adopt what's called a mitigated negative declaration, effectively saying, yes, our project will have impacts, but we have a way to mitigate those impacts to a place where they are not significant anymore. And so what we're going to do instead of adopting an EIR is adopt a mitigated negative declaration. Um, again, the process here is um, that the agency must issue a notice of intent to adopt the MND uh, with the negative declaration and initial study attached. There's a public review period. Uh, and then there's a notice of determination. One additional thing when it comes to mitigative neg negative declarations is that agencies must adopt a mitigation monitoring program to ensure that the mitigation measures that have been listed out in the initial study are actually done, right? Because otherwise, you know, maybe, uh, uh, less upstanding public agencies may say, yes, we're going to do all this, we're going to do all this, and then do none of them. Uh, and so those are 
we haven't got to the EIR yet, but up until there, you'll see there are various off-ramps, options, a lot of fact analyses about what is the impact of your project on the environment? Is it an impact that the law has found to be effectively minimal and therefore an exemption exists? Or is it an impact that uh, maybe there are no impacts and you can get a negative declaration and move on? Or maybe there is an impact, but all the impacts can be mitigated and you can do a mitigated negative, de negative declaration and move on. Um, but say you've come this far and negative declaration is not right for you, mitigated negative declaration doesn't fit the bill either. Uh, next, and the meat of sort of most environmental analysis is the environmental impact report. Next slide, please. So this is a general overview of the EIR process. Uh, you have a notice of preparation, uh, the draft, uh, completion and notice of availability, then a public review and public comment period, final EIR, um, and then a certifying, you certify the EIR, issue findings, approve the project, and adopt a notice of determination. Um, notices of preparation should include a description of the project, the location of the project, and the probable environmental effects of the project. Uh, draft EIRs, um, are usually prepared by consultants. As you've seen, those are big documents with a lot of pages, and it is rare for public agencies to have the staff or the time to do it themselves, so they usually get, into, get a consultant to do that job. Once the draft is complete, uh, a notice goes out, uh, and the notice goes out to the Office of Planning and Research uh, that says, hey, our, our EIR is complete. It's available now to review. Um, go ahead and review it. Uh, then we start the public review, public comment period. Uh, the time on this uh, changes depending on the scope of the project, but between 30 to 60 days usually. Uh, and then after the public comment, is, public comment period is over, uh, you have a final EIR, which includes the draft EIR, all the public comments and recommendations, a list of commenters and responses to the comments. So uh, the sort of good news, bad news is the final document will be larger than that. <laughs> so um, that's kind of what you have to look forward to in the next few months. Uh, and once the final EIR is ready, the public agency certifies that the EIR was completed in compliance with CEQA, that the agency reviewed and considered the information contained in the EIR, and the final EIR reflects the agency's independent judgment and analyses. Um, the agency then issues findings and approves the project if that's the decision they make. Uh, required for approval of a project is that a finding that the impact has been mitigated, that mitigation is within the responsibility and jurisdiction of another agency, um, or um, there is a, you can also what is do is that there are unavoidable significant impacts that are acceptable due to overriding considerations. Um, and then once once agency has made all those findings, you issue a notice of determination. Uh, and that's kind of the EIR process. As you can see, it's, it's a lot. Um, and a lot, and it is more so that it is very technical, very fact intensive. And again, the goal is not to say whether a project is good or bad. The goal is to let public agencies know what is the impact of your project going to have? What is the thing that you may not have thought about because um, you know maybe there is a endangered fish that lives in one of the rivers that you just don't know about, and that's an impact your project's going to have. Uh, and so the goal is to allow public agencies to make their decisions with all that information available and also to let the public know what the agency is thinking, what the impacts will be, and allow them to comment um, and so that is why one of the big parts of the EIR process is the public review process. If you go forward to you, please. Um, the minimum 30-day agency for public review period, so 30 days minimum for draft EIRs. When a state agency needs to review it, there's a 45-day minimum. Uh, and during that time, um, members of the public other agencies will submit written comments to 
the, the lead agency that is considering the EIR um, and the lead agency must consider those comments um, and prepare written responses to comments on significant environmental issues. Um, the comments and responses and any changes to the draft EIR make up the final EIR. So basically, you have an EIR, it's come up, you know, the board has seen the draft, it's out in the public for review. The public will review and comment, and then the consultants will go back and take those comments and see where they talk about significant environmental impacts, prepare responses to those impacts, uh, and make changes where necessary to the EIR. And the document that you get at the end of all this will track all of that, will say, this was our draft, this is the change we're making, these are the comments we received, these are all the people that commented. Uh, and so all of that will sort of come up in the final EIR. Um, if you go forward two, please. Uh, after the uh, public comment period, it's project approval time. This is when you, you take all of this information uh, and you make specific findings real to approve the EIR and the project or not. Uh, this is typically done via resolution and then the staff would file a notice of determination uh, saying, we have approved this EIR, we're moving forward with this project, go ahead and file with uh, OPR. Uh, and that's the, end of the, that's the end of the process. Uh, you'll see a lot of this is more about the technical analyses of what does your project do. Um, and, while, and what the law really does is provide a process. How that process plays out in real life is based entirely upon the facts on the ground. Um, and, and that is sort of the highest level overview of CEQA that I can provide. Uh, next one, please. So are there any questions I can answer? That was a lot of information, so if you need a minute, that's, that's okay. Thank you for uh, that presentation. One, one question, you going through the draft that we have, um, I guess, the reason I'm saying this is mainly to, as an informative, and that, that this is how I'm taking it, when there's something that's listed as a less than significant, that doesn't diminish the impact it is on the, on the project. So, so just for example, um, like on the transportation, uh, looking at for the Argonaut area, it, it uh, says level of significant, significance before mitigation less than, the, less than significant. That's not saying that it's a minor issue. It's not saying that it's something that we don't need to put the time in as far as addressing. It's just saying that the changes from what's existing to what's going to be in the future is not that different. Is that? Uh, well, not, I would, you know, maybe not even that far. What it less than significant means is that the thresholds of significance are a standard that are set in law. Um, and what less than significant means is that it is below that standard. Uh, what that actually means for your community from a political, uh, practical perspective, uh, d it does not diminish its importance in any way. But what it does say is that the law has defined significance to be this, and you are here. Mm -hmm. That's all it says. Mm -hmm. and I, I guess I just want to make that clear. Um, or when, as we have our future discussions, the CIR is not diminishing no. the needs or, or the you know what what we're planning for for the transportation. As an example, there's there's other issues, but that's just just throwing that out there as an example. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and and it might be helpful to think about the EIR as a technical document, as opposed to a policy document. Right, it is about the data and where does that data line up with established thresholds. It is not about saying this is the right move or the wrong move. Um, that is that is not CEQA's ambit. Um, it is a technical document. Thank you. Yep. Mrs. Parker, do you have any questions? Come on. Uh, is Mr. Marzano online and does he have any questions?
give him a moment for that. Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't have any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Marzano. Could you go over, I know that in the last, when we came the last time, when we first got a copy of all this, we had talked about significant but unavoidable. Can you kind of just explain that a little bit again? Sure. Um, yeah, that is a, again, that's a technical finding that uh, PlaceWorks and Duane, who was here last time, uh, did their analysis and found that there were certain impacts that were significant but unavoidable. With SQL allows you to do is say that yes, there are places where there are unavoidable significant impacts that may or may not be able to be mitigated. However, there are a series of overriding considerations that say that we should move forward regardless. And when you eventually see a copy of the final EIR, you will all see is also see a statement of overriding considerations that will explain exactly why those considerations are more important, uh, and, or not more important is the wrong word, but why those considerations override the finding of significant but unavoidable. Can I just, I'm just trying to clarify exactly what the scope of CEQA is. So when you go through all of this stuff and I, when they're, the CEQA is not meant to address safety concerns or anything like that. It's just simply environmental. Is that correct? Yeah, so I'll, I'll actually list these out. Uh, so, uh, significant environmental effects on aesthetics, agricultural resources, air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, geology and soils, hazards and hazardous materials, hydrology and water quality, land use and planning, mineral resources, noise, population and housing, public services, transportation and traffic, utilities and service systems. Uh, myself, I don't have any questions at this time. I'm sure that if I come up with some, I can talk to staff and they can get in touch Absolutely. with you. And that, uh, I wanna thank you for your presentation. No problem. Very informative. I did sit through one at the CSBA conference, and it just, you know, resonates again how important it is. And like you said, it's a technical document. It's bringing out these are all the factors. This is what we need to look at because speaking up here for myself and probably most of the board, we wouldn't know anything to look at as far as what to look for in a project of this size, and that's why we went out and got a consultant to do the heavy looking. And I know I've spent three or four days going through it, reading, page tabbing, and I've already been into Mr. Critchfield's office with questions and everything. So uh, again, I wanna thank you, Mr. Halani, for your uh, presentation this evening. Absolutely, and we're happy to answer any questions uh, after the fact too, if you let staff know, and we'll get right on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, with that, I wish to close the study session and we will be back at 5.30 to go into closed session and move on to, with our regular board meeting. Thank you for attending.
Okay, I'm going to call to order the uh, meeting of the Amador County Unified School District regular board meeting. Uh, are there any public comments for closed session? Don't see any. So with that, we will move into closed session and hope to return at 6.30, where we will report out at that time. Thank you.
good to go. Welcome, everyone. We're going to begin the Amador County Unified School District Board meeting. I have to open my agenda because we do have something to report out tonight from closed session. Give me one moment, please. We are reconvened, it is 6.30. And Dr. Gibson, do we have any deletions or corrections to the agenda? Um, we just have one agenda change. It's not really a change, it's just an order of change that we would like to request that 15.6 move up to the first item under discussion action, please. And I put that in the notes as well. Okay, um, do we need to vote on that? So we're gonna do 15.6 first, everybody, so you're aware. All right, thank you, Dr. Gibson. We're gonna do the pledge, if you were here earlier. I'm gonna report out. Oh, sorry. I skipped it. You mentioned it, but you skipped it. Okay, by a vote of four to one, with uh, Shane Crow voting no, the board voted to ratify a settlement agreement with a district teacher under which the teacher has resigned from their position with the district and the district has accepted that teacher's re resignation. Okay, now we're gonna do the pledge. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands Thank you, everyone. We have two presentations tonight. First, we have Mrs. Peters for Cedar Creek Elementary. Welcome. <laughs> board President Burns, Dr. Gibson, board members Whitaker, Marzano, Crow. Parker, student representatives, and our cabinet members. I'm pleased to be here tonight to recognize four of my staff members for their continued hard work and dedication to our students and our school. So first, I'd like to introduce Claire Gunzelman. Claire, if you wanna come on up here. Claire is a special education aide at Sutter Creek Primary. Claire works with our TK through second grade students, supporting them individually or in small groups. She also pushes into classrooms to provide support to students, and she helps with yard duty and lunch supervision, but Claire is so much more than that. She helps with anything and everything that needs to be done. She is a huge asset to our school. She always seems to uh, know what needs to be done, and she does it. If I need any information on anything, She's the one to go to. She usually has the information I need. She's super observant, diligent, and takes notice when something isn't quite right. And she is very much appreciated and valued. So thank you, Claire. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize Maddie Watts. Maddie, if you wanna come on up. So Maddie teaches a first, second grade combination class at Sutter Creek Primary, and she actually volunteered to teach the combo. And she has not only taken on that challenge, but has thrived. She is very creative with her lessons, and this creates enthusiastic learners in her classroom. Her classroom is super well organized, and there is a calmness present in there every day. Maddie is also a very quiet leader. She's well respected by her colleagues, families, and students. She has volunteered to take charge of our school garden, and she spends many days weeding, planting, and watering, especially during the summer months. In addition, last summer, she redid the whole staff lounge at Sutter Creek Primary. She painted, cleaned, and decorated to make it more welcoming for our staff. She's also very tech savvy and my go-to for anything technology related. So thank you, Maddie.
And next I have Amanda Henry. So Amanda teaches sixth grade at Sutter Creek Elementary. Amanda is a huge advocate for social emotional learning and volunteers a lot of her time to learn more about it to support her students. She also offers her time to support staff with SEL. She does a phenomenal job building relationships with her students and families and supports them every day. Amanda is dedicated to the success of every one of her students and it shows when you walk into her classroom. Her morning meeting in her classroom is a great way to start off the day. She provides many strategies for her students to use when they are frustrated or angry. She really does focus on the whole student. It's not just about academics. She knows her students well and values their unique traits. So keep up the great work, Amanda. And then um, I have an award here for Kelsey Newman Lauder, who's not here tonight. She was unable to make it. Um, Amanda's going to accept this on her behalf. So Kelsey, Kelsey is a health aide at Sutter Creek Elementary. And not only does she support our students with medical needs, but she also provides support to many of our special education students and provides extra support in the resource classroom. She goes above and beyond to provide any extra support that is needed. She wants to be busy and is happy to take on extra tasks to help others. She does this with a smile and a positive attitude every day. Kelsey is the ultimate team player and she will help with whatever needs to be done. You can always count on her and she is a true asset to our school and our district. So thank you to Kelsey and we'll get this to her. And uh, President Burns, I just want to mention that they're all Amador High School graduates. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Peters. Dr. Palisuelos has a presentation from HR. Good evening, trustees, members of the public. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite Diana Hartman to come up to the front. So Diana Hartman is a human resources technician in the human resources division. She's a graduate of our Amador County Public Schools. Uh, but before anything else, I'd like to recognize that she has a couple of special guests here this evening. She has her grandmother, Sandra Lovett, and her boyfriend, Isaiah Thornton, back in the back over there. So big round of applause for them. I wanted to start out by that because that's a big part of Diana's work in the Human Resources Division. It's about the team, it's about the family. Um, she's provided inspired service to our, our organization since October 24th of 2022. She is a true team player in every sense of the word. Um, Diana, mo most folks do not know this, is one of the first people in the district office every morning. She is responsible for organizing our substitutes and getting messages out to all their different school sites and does a phenomenal job with that. On top of that, she was also our lead with all of the volunteer um, applications this year. Thousands and thousands of, okay, no, not thousands, but, but quite a few, at least a thousand. She, uh, she handles her work with, with um, she's always professional. She handles herself well, even in the toughest situations. And I, as her supervisor in the unit, am just so proud of the hard work and dedication she's expressed to the Amador County Unified School District. She's an instrumental member of our team. She understands what is needed to make our division successful because we know that if we're successful, we help the entire County Office of Education and County Unified School District be successful. In, all, in everything else, she's got a fantastic smile. She has a great wit about her. And one of the things that I especially appreciate about her is her can-do attitude. And so for that and so many other reasons, we thank and recognize Ms. Dan Hartman. So congratulations. <laughs> And just so you know, every bit the team player, when I talk to our team about recognizing Diana, a big thanks to everyone from the Human Resources Department that came out to support her this evening. So thank you. Did you graduate from Amador or Argonaut? <laughs> Amador. <laughs> I, I love to see all of our alumni that come back. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. I love that trivia. 
that's a good, Sorry. That's a good one. Okay, next on our agenda, we have employee organizations. Um, Mrs. Jensen for ACTA. Uh, yes, here she is. So while she's making her way up to the podium, I want to um, remind our, our public comment um, card submitters that we will call you just before the item that you wrote on here. So we have two for consolidation, that's item 11. We have two for just public comment, that's item 12. And we have one um, for consolidation EIR, and that is 15.6, but we will be doing that at the beginning of the 15th. Thank you. Sure. Good evening. Good evening, board members, President Gibson, cabinet members. Um, this is short and sweet. We'll be meeting again tomorrow, and we're looking forward to um, in negotiations. And one of the topics is be to be attracting and retaining quality certificated teachers. So we look forward to that conversation and uh, a positive outcome from it. Thank you. And Mrs. Martz for CSEA. I don't see her. Okay. Um, so we are to item 11. So we do have two speakers who wanted to speak on consolidation. Um, I have Mr. Cody Gold. And following Mr. Gold, we'll have Diane Bennett. Welcome, Mr. Gold. Uh, good evening. Um, some of you may remember uh, I sent an email uh, before the December meeting regarding the uh, facilities utilization master plan, um, which Mr. Critchfield uh, replied um, and said he'd be happy to meet with me. Um, I know some of you had some questions, some of the similar questions. Um, I plan to uh, provide you all with a follow-up of all of the, uh, the questions that I was asked, and uh, Mr. Critchfield said it was okay if I took some notes, kind of paraphrasing those answers. Um, but there were a couple of items that um, he wasn't able to answer right then and there, but told me to get me the, the info, which I did receive today, um, but I got it at like 3 o'clock, so I haven't had a chance to really dive into it, but I'll hit a couple of the highlights that just stood out to me right away. Um, as I said in my email, I do feel that uh, Ion Elementary School was kind of given a, a bad name and used as a uh, driving factor to, to push the consolidation issue. Um, one of the things that I believe uh, supports that is... Um, the 2021 uh, FIT, which is the inspection rubric that was used, um, that gave Ion Elementary somewhere in the 50 percentile, um, that Mr. Critchfield was one of the uh, in inspectors, along with um, a job estimator and Mimi Dean Williams from the uh, consulting agency. They pointed out there's five critical deficiencies, uh, and in those deficiencies, they were spread out amongst the subtopics so that that entire section got a 0%, which brought the rating down to where it landed. I just received today the 2023 FIT for the same facility. Um, this one was conducted by a Joseph Lewis, which says he's a CSI consultant. Um, it had zero critical deficiencies listed. None of the ones that were listed in the 2021 showed back up in the 2023. Um, I did receive a list of the projects that were major projects that were conducted. One of them was an awning or roof, which Mr. Critchfield said he thought that was one of the critical deficiencies. It looks like all Sierra roof did replace that, um, but none of the other ones, there was nothing about sewer, there was nothing about electrical, any of the other things. Um, with that, I, I'm sure I'm running out of time. I can't, I'll, I will follow up with an email with the rest of the questions. Um, Lastly, uh, I also sent you all an email today uh, regarding the $1.7 million in costs associated with planning, design, engineering, consulting of the consolidation plan thus far. Um, I would hope or would appreciate a, a follow-up if you guys are able to follow up with that and get an answer as to if that money was approved by the board um, prior to going out with those conceptual drawings for the plan, um, or if not, under what authority was it authorized to have all those drawings uh, made up. And um, I think that's about all I have for this topic. Thank you. Diane, are you here? She's not. She's, okay, she, she does have another card later. 
Okay. Um, so moving on to 11.1 .1, academics, Mrs. Pichette. Thank you. Just waiting for the slideshow to come up. Okay. Okay, so this is now the second in um, second presentation of um, benefits to consolidation with um, academics. Um, as described in the last board meeting, we're centering this themed um, presentation on our strategic plan. The strategic plan is a five-year plan. Um, it was adopted in uh, 2023 and goes through 2028. Next slide, please. Tonight, we will be focusing on objective B um, with the intention of focusing on all objectives in relation to ed educational services benefits to consolidation. Um, as we as we go through um, future board meetings, but objective B specifically focuses on systems of student supports. Next slide, please. So in the area of system of student supports, um, since August of 2023, our ACOE director of school and community integration, Amanda Avila, who is here tonight, has been working with district site and community advisory teams to do a needs and assets assessment. In doing so, one theme that rose to the top is in the area of need was providing all students and families with access to resources. One fiscally responsible way to do this is to have a centralized location for students and families to access those resources. When the board approved consolidation, grant funding was awarded for the planning of the future Student and Family Resource Center. The Resource Center will be located in a central location. The purpose of the Resource Center is to support students and families in meeting their basic needs in one place. The staff at the Student and Family Resource Center will support students and families in navigating district and local resources. The Student and Family Resource Center will have a food pantry, clothing closet, personal hygiene items, lending library exchange, educational items exchange, tutoring, a computer lab, job assistance, family education, support and referrals to community partners, dental and medical contractors, transportation services for students and families, mobile support, and so much more. There is no fiscal impact to this project as the facility is already owned in ACUSD by ACUSD and the contracts and services are funded through the Community Schools Grant. We look forward to the opening of the Student and Family Resource Center as nothing like it has ever existed in Amador County Unified before and it will allow for our district to better serve students and families in new ways. Student and Family Resource Centers are popping up in districts all over the country as states are seeing the need to help connect families and schools to much needed resources. States are now designating funding to make that happen. At ACUSD, we look forward to being pioneers in establishing a robust student and family resource center to serve students and families. With consolidation, we have the space and have already tapped into grants that allow us to do just that. Next slide, please. Next, beginning in July of 2023, the ACOA Director of Student School and Community Integration, Amanda Avila, has managed the SB HIP grant, bringing wellness centers to Amador County Schools. On the first day of school this year, the first wellness center opened its doors to staff and students in Amador High School. This was done in partnership under the MO, an MOU with Sierra Child and Family Services, who hired and trained staff to operate the wellness center at Amador High School. The Wellness Center is staffed with clinicians to help support staff and students with direct counseling, crisis intervention, skills classes, navigation to outside providers, and staff support. Students are referred to the Amador High Wellness Center in various ways, such as through counseling and admin teams, self-referral, or parent referrals. As of early January, Amador Wellness Center had over 49 students access the Wellness Center for specific support. There were 293 individual counseling sessions in those 84 days of school. In addition, many students came to the Wellness Center informally to check in, relax, visit, participate in social activities, games, and socialize. The Wellness Center staff attend school staff meetings, events, and provide wellness activities and development support for both staff and students alike. 
The Amador Wellness Center has become such an integral part of the high school campus that it became apparent that there was a need to open one at Argonaut High School as well. The staff have been hired and the location is determined with an anticipated opening this winter. After consolidation was board approved last year, the grant was rewritten to account for the fact that upon the opening of the consolidated high school and the consolidated junior high school, there will be a well-established wellness center already operating on each site. This will be an ideal support for staff and students during transition. In addition, more grant work is being done with the intent to allow for additional wellness centers or student support centers to open at all school sites where services and support can be tailored to the direct needs at that site. In the meantime, we are excited that work is already being done at both the Argonaut and Amador campuses to have wellness centers already fully operational at what will become the Consolidated High School and Junior High campuses. Also, please note that an informational video in this slide showcasing the Amador High School Wellness Center has been shared out via various platforms and by our communication specialist. And now Lori will play this video for us right now. Director of School and Community Integration at Amador County Office of Education. Part of my role is I get to work with community organizations to partner in bringing support and services to staff, students, and families. Today I'm at Amador High School and I'd like to show you something special we've created with one of those partners. Hi, my name is Amanda Robinson. I'm the Regional Director with Sierra Child and Family Services and we're super excited for the opportunity to work with Amador County Unified School District and opening wellness centers on school campuses. Welcome to the Wellness Center where our services include direct counseling, skills building, and navigation to outside resources. Come on in. So at this point, I'd be happy, we would be happy to answer questions as Amanda Avila is here to help um, answer questions about those wellness centers. I would also love to gather some feedback from the board of future um, items that, that you might be interested in regarding academic benefits of consolidation. Do you guys wanna go down the line? start with um, Ms. Clement. Did you have any comments or suggestions? No, I have no comments. Okay. Mr. Crow? Yeah, thank you. Um, how, uh, I guess, what has been done previous to these uh, centers? Um, what has been done in the past? Anything? Are you referring to, to, those to, the, types to the wellness of center, um, what, is, what has been in place for the schools before this? Right, well, these are our first wellness centers. So it's all brand new, new to Amador County, uh, thanks to grants that are available through partnerships with the community and CDE. Okay, I, th I, just, I think this is a great idea and I think it's something that uh, uh, all, our, all our schools need and so you. thank you for your effort. Yeah, it's exciting work, thank you. This one is currently located in Amador, and then is there another one planned, like you said, somewhere else for? Correct, yes. Okay. We're, um, we're in the process of opening at Argonaut High School, so staff have been hired and trained, and we've identified a location and getting ready to open uh, at some point in the next probably month. Very soon. Yes, very soon. 
Um, and so starting at the two high schools was a, was a big movement that we were able to change in updating the grant that has provided the funds to allow us to open the wellness centers. Um, so when consolidation was approved, it was a perfect opportunity to amend that so that we could then have um, the wellness centers that were already well established at both the consolidated high school and junior high. Well, I would love to come by and see the Wellness Center in action. And I realize some of the stuff that they might be talking about might be confidential and personal among the people, and I can understand that. But I would like to see, make an appointment sometime. I would love to do that. We had to come by and see that. So actually, why don't you go ahead and tell them about sure. um, Friday. Friday? Friday, yes. So um, actually, they didn't talk too much about it in our video, but um, the Wellness Center is also operating um, monthly events um, for all students. So on Friday, I believe at 11.45, so during lunch, um, the Wellness Center staff will be um, out in the quad with the whole student body, um, and they will be creating uh, vision boards for the new year. Um, so they have all the materials and supplies to do that, and they have since invited myself and Cabinet to join us, so I am happy to send out an invite um, to our board to see if you guys would like to join us. And that's at Amador High School? Yes, at Amador. So I'll send that to you guys tonight, and then um, we'll also, as soon as we find out um, what other events they're hosting, um, I would be happy to include you guys in an invite. And if we're not able to do it, then we can always go by for a tour. I've popped various people in um, when they're not providing confidential counseling. Yeah, I think it would be a real good idea to see it firsthand. Yes, we'd love to bring you. So I'm about to age myself here. Um, when I was at Argonaut, we had peer counselors. Yes. I don't know if you guys remember that far back. Um, we haven't had them for a long time now, but I am so excited to see this resource being so accessible and so welcoming um, for our students. And um, I don't know, I mean, nobody remembers this, but a couple years ago, we had it show up on our LCAP that we were gonna allocate $5,000 of our funding to a family resource center. Um, and when I asked about it, it was like, it was a Chromebook <laughs> and a printer. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was surprised, and I didn't mean to surprise anybody, but I was disappointed. And the family resource center that, that um, is being planned for is definitely more along the lines, but bigger than what I had anticipated being told about. Um, and I love that it's actually not on a school site mm -hmm. for parents to have some confidentiality if, ne if they need it. Um, and these wellness centers are just amazing. And it reminds me of the care closets that I know the mm -hmm. teachers had started in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously this is building you know, on, on that, that. Um, way of caring for our students. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Special work. Thanks for the opportunity to share about it. This is exciting. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you. And um, Mrs. Bichette. Thank you so much. Um, for facilities, Mr. Critchfield, no update, correct? No. Okay, and we have no athletics update, but we do have a general update. This is a follow-up to Board Member Parker's request last board meeting, I believe it was, about the breakdown of expenditures. I know uh, she had expressed uh, concern about what was approved by the board and what wasn't. These expenditures go back to May of 2022, before um, some of that time was before you were um, even on the board. And uh, we have, every five years, we go out for an architectural firm. And as part of the consolidation direction, um, administration was given the authority to move forward with um, any and all needs to make consolidation happen. So as you notice, the bulk of the expenditures are in architecture, design, and engineering through our architecture firm, um, Cal Design West and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, yes, thank you for getting this to us. I appreciate that. Um, so with the approval of all that stuff, was that perhaps, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was a resolution we passed in January of last year. Was that the, the one, was that, was that the one? Do you remember what I'm talking about, Julia? Yeah, it's January or February, um, but I know that Jared, you mentioned this goes all the way back to May. So right. we have one lump sum for um, 
the architects, mm -hmm. uh, design and engineering, but obviously every time we have a modification. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right? So, so the first round of architect fees had to do with consolidation projects connected to the So bond. that first conceptual site plan, right. which obviously that kicked off in May of 2022. Correct. Okay. We and are not we working went. from that plan right now specifically. I mean, that's still the goal. Yes, it's still the goal. And there well, are a couple portions of it that are the same, but the mm -hmm. majority of it, the, you know, the, the main project, the 10 classroom building that we are now moving forward with was not part of the 2022 <laughs> bond. And so, yeah, we have design and architectural fees and everything that went into the designs for the 2022 bond. And then once January of last year, we moved into um, plan B. And so it involves that those planning dollars as well. Okay. Do these, so it just to be clear on what all of those fees kind of entail. It includes those fees that you have listed there include the original conceptual plans from the original bond measure plan. It also includes the revised conceptual plans that we saw and voted on last year as well. Correct. Okay. And then do, so that means that all of these plans are, so all the buildings for all phases of consolidation included in those architectural plans, or we have to go back and spend more money? Like for example, like building out Setter Creek Elementary at the upper campus eventually, when we do that, is that all included in that already or would that be so Additional. Sutter Creek Elementary, we did not go into the depth of the designs of those, because if you remember, even in the bond plan, that was not part of phase one of projects. <laughs> phase one of projects in the bond was focused on the Ion Junior High campus, converting it to Ion Elementary and on the high school. So the, that was the focus for the bond. So all three of those, though, are included in, the, in that cost? The Ion Elementary? Ion in the high school, the high not school. Sutter Creek. Okay. Um, yeah, there was a, and you're right, there was Jackson. some design at Jackson for a building there as well. And, and there so actually was included. quite a bit of design for Sutter Creek. We designed that two-story building, we designed, so there was design work that he did do. For yeah, just not to the same level as the buildings at the high school, Ion Junior High, and Jackson. And then have we submitted those plans to the state architect yet? Does that have to, does that, how does that work? We have to submit all those plans, right? If we're moving forward with that, we have to submit those to the state architect? Correct. Okay. Have they been submitted? The high school plans have been submitted. We're in line. You in wait line. in line for months. Okay. So um, the Ion Junior High plans have not been submitted, but will be soon. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. Ms. Clement, did you have any questions? I don't want to skip you because you're way down at the end. No, I have no questions. Okay. Mr. Crow. Uh, on the salaries, is that... Uh, the two consolidated uh, positions? There's three. There's yes. three? Yeah. Principal. Principal, athletic director, and the administrative assistant. Okay. Thank you. Doesn't the athletic director also have an assistant? Yes. Yeah. That's the assistant. That's the assistant, is oh, to the athletic oh, oh. director. The consolidated principal does not have an assistant. Oh, poor Mr. Brewer. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jim, did you have any? Okay. I don't have any questions. I think Kayla did a great job. And we don't have Mr. Marzano on the, on the phone, so I would be asking him at this point. Um, we are to our public comment section for the evening. We have... Hello? He is? Oh. I am here. Did you have a Hello? question, Mr. Marzano? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. I didn't. I didn't know that you had joined us. Yes. Okay. So moving on to public comment um, for non-agenda items, I do have three speaker cards for the non-agenda public comment section. I'm going to read the blurb. A person wishing to be heard by the board shall first be recognized by the president and shall then proceed to comment as briefly as the subject permits. Individual speakers shall be allowed three minutes to address the board on non-agenda items. The board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes. With board consent, the board president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public presentation depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. The president may take a poll of speakers for or against a particular issue and may ask that additional persons speak only if they have something new to add. 
If you wish to address the board, please complete a speaker card and give it to the board clerk or communications specialist. We have three cards. We have Mr. Cody Gold, um, followed by Mrs. Diane Bennett. Has she, has she arrived yet? I don't see her yet. Um, and then Ms. Mrs. Stacy Tyler. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Thank you. Um, so tonight, I just kind of <clears throat> want to talk about the uh, the public comment process and uh, input from the public in general. Um, last week, uh, I received a notification on Parent Square for a community input meeting for consolidation. Uh, that notification came in 50, 50 five zero minutes uh, before the scheduled start time <clears throat> of that meeting. Um, I had never seen the link on the Consolidation Hub until after getting that notification. I immediately went to the Consolidated Hub. I've spent a lot of time on there. Um, and I'm like, where is it? And it was right on the top. So I, I don't know when it was added there or when it was put up there. Um, but <clears throat> it's, it's tough to have a public input meeting or community input meeting when the community isn't aware of it. Um, in reading those meeting uh, agendas, it states that the next meeting is scheduled by the public who attends when they decide is a good time. But then I've also heard that um, it's, they, they weren't gonna schedule another meeting because they only schedule them when new info arises or comes up. Um, the other thing is the, the public comment um, at these meetings specifically. Um, most city council meetings or government agency meetings that I've attended or been a part of, um, when there's an agenda or action item, discussion item, the, the presentation is made by whoever's making the presentation, then they open it up to public comment, and then it comes back to the board for discussion, and then they take a vote. Um, last, last month, there was three times where something came up in the presentation, but I didn't get an opportunity to speak on it because I didn't submit a speaker card at the beginning of the meeting. So it's hard to know that I want to speak on it if I don't have all the information, right? It would be like asking you guys to have your discussion before you ever get the presentation. Um, so I, I would like to see if the board can revisit that process. I'm sure it's in the bylaws or the um, thing and open up to public comment at the end of the, the presentation. Um, since it looks like I have maybe one more minute, those three things from last week, uh, Mr. Hunkins gave athletic presentation, um, said that there would, yeah, the focus turned to how, how what the great opportunities it's gonna be because we're gonna have freshman teams we're gonna have uh, men's volleyball. But it, there was also a 25% jersey savings. So if you're saving 25% cost in jersey savings, that's because you have 25% less players. So opportunity, we, you know, we focused on, oh, it's great opportunity, there's gonna be freshman teams. Yeah, but there's still an overall number of less players. Um, the other thing was the three-year budget that Mr. Critchfield um, presented. The third year, which is the first year of consolidation, was the highest expenditure out of all the three years. And I know costs go up and whatnot, so there's, I'm sure there's some projected, but to say that we're gonna save a bunch of money um, with consolidation, but then in your third year, three year budget, the third year is the highest year, thought that was interesting. And then lastly, um, fiscal responsibility has been the name of the, uh, the game. I'm sorry, Mr. Gold, your three okay. minutes are up. But the entire Argonaut campus is green, so it's gonna cost a lot of money to I'm sorry, since Diane is not here yet, um, and if she does show up before um, Ms. Mrs. Tyler is through, we'll, we'll come back to her. Mrs. Tyler? Hi, my name is Stacy Tyler. I am an Amador County resident and a local business owner and the mother of two school-aged children. And I'm here today because I want to express a concern about the way in which um, a child wanting to study a university course or a college course is restricted, and that perhaps that policy could change or just be allowed some flexibility. So specifically, um, I have a child at Amador High School. She'd be offended if I called her a child. I'll say I have a young person at Amador High School. Um, we love the school, love the teachers, but we unfortunately did not have a good experience with one particular teacher. It's gone on for a while. And so what we did after having originally raised a concern about it this year because it presented itself again, 
um, we finally went to the principal about it. This principal's great. Um, and what we were ultimately encouraged to do was to file a complaint. I don't even like that word, complaint, because I feel that there are more informal ways to raise these kind of concerns that might not, for example, go on that teacher's permanent jacket, that don't start the ball rolling maybe uncontrollably downhill to start some kind of personnel action. But my understanding was there's no other real way for us to get an exception. So specifically, my daughter's in Algebra 2. It's a graduation requirement. But that is also offered at the local college as college algebra. So that would be available as a fully asynchronous course at the Foothill College, which would be a perfect opportunity for her to go there because there has been such a consistent and persistent problem with this particular educator. But because the district policy says this child cannot the young person cannot attend the college course if that course is offered at their school. We kind of had no option except to go forward with the complaint in the hopes it could be resolved rapidly and that our daughter would be able to enroll in that college course. So I'm expressing concern about that because I would much prefer to go, on, to go a more informal way because all we're seeking, we don't want punishment of that educator. We hope that educator will get help. But what we want is just the very practical solution of her being able to enroll in that college algebra course. And we have a very limited time window. The course begins on the 29th, which means we have to enroll by the 20th. That gives us three days. And I realize I only have about 15 seconds left. So I will say that I reached out because I was encouraged to do that as quickly as possible. I did it the very next day I met with someone, turned it in right away, tried to make our concerns concise and the relief we were seeking very specific and limited. And then I asked, when might I hear back? So I didn't hear back the day I submitted it. I heard back today um, when Mr. Palazuelos, or I should say Dr. Palazuelos, responded to me and what I assume was a form answer that simply I'm, said. I'm sorry, Mrs. Tyler, your three minutes are up. Yes, sir. May I have 15 yeah. seconds to complete my remarks? Thank you, Ms. Burns. So um, his response said, we have 60 days to get back to you. And as you can see, that's not going to be able to address the problem. So I respectfully request that the board um, consider addressing that policy. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Gedney, I still have your card, but it's for, it's not for, you put, you put the EIR, so it'll be right before the EIR, okay? So I didn't skip you. you. Yes. <laughs> um, that's our last um, general non-agenda public comment. Um, and we are now moving on to the consent agenda, which does have a lot of items on it, um, including warrants, um, surplus, donations, lots of exciting overnight field trips, um, current personnel recommendations. We do have the school accountability report cards, if anybody would like to um, ask questions about that, and our Williams Act quarterly report for the first half of the school year, or for the quarter, October through December. Are there any questions on the consent agenda? I did have some questions or comments on the um, accountability report cards. Um, so I was looking through them, and I'm not, I'm not going to go over every single accountability card. There's a lot of information in there. But um, so there was a whole bunch of issues it looked like with just like smaller kind of maintenance items that are tagged on there. Um, so for I mainly focused on Amador and Argonaut right on this particular one. But it just seems like some of them are such minor fixes, like soap dispensers or water fountains out of order, or ripped wallpaper, like damaged ceiling tiles, missing vent covers, those things. Are those things, I mean, I would assume that these are things that can be easily fixed by our maintenance staff that work there, things like that. Um, I feel like doing some of those small things can make a huge difference in like the look and the feel of our schools in, in general. Is that... Yeah, and that's a constant, you know, this is a, a snapshot in time of what was going on, but I mean, a soap dispenser might be working depending on the hour. I remember when I was principal, they were going through a phase of how many punches does it take to knock the soap dispenser off the wall. So again, that sometimes that's not, you know, the case long term, but it could just be at the time that that was looked at, they were replacing it. So we, have, we go through hundreds and hundreds of work orders every month. 
I, yeah, I get that. When I was at Jackson Junior High, it was how many jumps can I jump on the sink to knock it off the wall? So that was a good one. Um, and then same kind of thing with our, same thing with most of them actually. It just seemed like a bunch of small kind of like running ticket orders. But then I was looking at some of our, some of our scores and I looked at the Argonaut and if I'm reading this correctly, it says that only 17% of students at Argonaut were proficient or exceeding the scores on the CAST test in math. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And only 55% in ELA, which I mean, more than half, but mm -hmm. okay. I mean, Amador is a little better, but not by like, you know, it's not some crazy number. 26% were proficient or passed the math portion, which mm -hmm. is crazy. But 73% in ELA, so that, that was like, all right, that's, that's okay. Um, is there a year-to-year -year comparison on those numbers by chance anywhere? Not that I need them right this second, I'm just kidding. Yes, okay. <laughs> so California Dashboard is is something that our state puts out and puts out all of our CAST score, scores in there and you can actually look year to year how we have either, yes. Mm -hmm. Did we test all during COVID shutdowns? I was not here. I don't think we did. No, so 2020, there was no testing at all. Um, 2021, um, I don't think there was testing either. We didn't resume until 2022. So I actually have looked at a lot of those scores, um, and I found what to be, what I found to be the most interesting for me was to look at the same cohort. So not necessarily um, my child's grade level in school, but but to look at like say, cause they, they measure things in certain grades. And so to look at math scores for grade 11 compared to grade, yeah, yeah. At all the grades down, but those years where it's the same kids that are being tested, because I found that to be more um, enlightening as far as if they started out at a really low score, which I'm 17 is pretty bad. Um, you totally get where you're going. I just saw the 17% yeah. and I'm like, so holy Moses. By the time they hit their junior year, what were they testing? Because it's always been said to me, oh, everybody ends up in the same place. They all catch up by the time they're, they're leaving high school. And so I went and dug. And, you know, somewhat, yes. I mean, not everybody catches up, but a lot of them do. Anyway. The, it was just the observing, moms yeah, the, yeah, on just the board, observing some interesting numbers. <laughs> we actually look at the Sarks. Um, <laughs> Mr. Crow, did you have questions on the consent agenda? No, I didn't. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. No. Okay. If we have no additional questions on the consent agenda, I move that we approve item 13, the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Crow. And we'll do a roll call vote. Is Mr. Marzano still on the phone? Yes. No. Okay. Um, Ms. Clement? Yes. For the advisory vote. Um, Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Okay. We are to communications, and there are none, correct? Okay. And now we are to Mr. Gedney. So I did, you may see me texting on my, I am just asking Mr. Marzano if he has questions, um, just for clarity. Okay, welcome Mr. Gedney. Thank you, uh, thank you Madam President, and members of the board, really appreciate the opportunity to come speak with you. Uh, I just wanna say first of all, I'm very encouraged, we're very encouraged to have your attorney reach out to us and try to set up a meeting. Very good, and uh, Dr. Critchfield, I'll be in contact with you and. Hopefully we can set that up as soon as possible. I'd like to include Caltrans, the county, city of Jackson, Sutter Creek representatives. Be really, really, really productive, appreciate that. I'd like to reiterate that ACTC is not opposed to this project. Uh, just did sit through the CEQA presentation by your attorney, uh, for, uh, started at four o'clock, and still not encouraged with your process. We still have a lot of concerns, and I'd just like to highlight those. There was a lot of discussion on loopholes exceptions, and that's really good for a um, project proponent. The developer, really, really good uh, direction, really good advice for a project proponent, but that's only one hat that you're wearing. <clears throat> you're also wearing 
the hat of the lead agency. Put yourself, you know, if you consider this, it's very unique. Um, there's no authority uh, with approval of this. You are the authority to approve your own project. So you have to be balancing this. And uh, your, your, <clears throat> your attorney did uh, mention, and, and actually going back to the old the, um, workshop on the 13th, um, Board Member Parker, you encapsulated the role of lead agency perfectly. When you asked the consultant if you have an ethical and a moral obligation to study the impacts at State Route 88 and Argonaut Lane. And I would submit to you, you also have a legal responsibility to do that. So thank you for that. <clears throat> um, your attorney said that your approval decision needs to be informed and balanced. Relying on VMT, vehicle miles traveled, is not balanced. Yes, people will be driving further. There will increase in VMT, but that's not what people are worried about. They're worried about State Route 88 and Argonaut Lane going from level of service D for existing conditions to level of service F with your project. That's obvious, and it's something that a lead agency should be concerned with. <clears throat> also, your attorney said the responsibility, you can point in the CEQA document to the responsibilities of other jurisdictions, but this doesn't mean that you can point fingers at other at agencies and jurisdictions. It needs, means you need to identify, disclose impacts, and work with responsible agencies to develop fair share contributions to mitigation solutions as your EIR consultant walked you through that process at that workshop. So again, thank you, um, Dr. Critchfield. I'll be in touch. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. I, I would just like to take a moment to thank all of our public speakers who addressed tonight for being so courteous. Um, I very much appreciate you and your comments and your deportment tonight. Thank you. Okay, so back to 15.1. No. No. Oh. So Mr. Item 15.6, you want to talk about it? I'm happy to talk about it. So yes, we opened the draft environmental impact report uh, public review period on December 15th. Um, by law, uh, we are required to have it open for 45 days. We, since the review period has opened up, we've received requests from five public agencies, the cities of Sutter Creek, Jackson, and I own, Amador County Transportation Commission, and the Amador County Department of Transportation and Public Works to extend that review period. Um, they've cited unusual circumstances. We have not identified unusual circumstances per the law, but do acknowledge that because this 45-day period extended over the holidays where many offices were closed or coming back to the board tonight to request not a 30-day extension, but instead a 15-day extension. So this would have the review period instead of ending on January 29th, it would end on February 13th. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, one question I have is, have you received any feedback as far as uh, what quantity of public comment has been received? Has there been questions or is there any any kind of uh, numbers? Has, has there been uh, some? No, the majority of the communication at this point has been to re extend the review period. Okay. So if we extend to 15 days, how many total days will that be for um, these agencies to give their public comment? Uh, 60, which is typically the max that you would do in, in a situation like this. And if we did a full 30, that would be 75 days that they had? Correct. Okay. Well, in looking at this, uh, you know, seeing as we did bring it out just before the holidays and we were shut down for two weeks, you know, our district office was, I think it's a very uh, good uh, thing to do to extend it by the 15 days. So that I just wanted to make sure that was said. That way everybody has a chance to understand that we want to hear their input. If Are there any additional questions for Jared? I'll move to approve uh, item 15.6 DER extension request. I'll second. 
Thank you, Mr. Crow, Mr. Whitaker. So we'll do a roll call vote. Is Mr. Marzano on the call? Okay. Um, the advisory vote, Ms. Clement? Yes. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. And I'm also a yes. So real quick, President Burns, so with, with the approval, the plan is tomorrow to update our website reflecting the new date. Uh, we did send to public agencies an electronic notification and via cer um, certified mail. The plan right now would be to send electronic communication to public agencies only with the extension notice and then the website would be updated accordingly. Real quick, does this extension apply to just the public agencies or just the public in general also? It's the public review period. Review it's period, not the public agency review period. Okay, but so public agencies use that as, as their an opportunity. Time. Okay, <laughs> got it. Okay, 15.1, Capital Adult Education Regional Consortium, voting name change. This is an exciting one in that, well, we had Mr. Medlin, Mr. Matt Medlin was serving a part of his job was principal of adult education. And so back in, ugh, I wanna say August or September, the board voted for Mr. Medlin to be a voting member of the uh, Capital Adult Education Regional Consortium, which we have been members of since 2015. But we now have a new principal of adult education who started with us as a teacher, Miss Diana Griffin. And so what I'm asking tonight is for the, bo the board to uh, vote and approve uh, Miss Griffin as our voting member of Carrick. If anybody um, has questions. No, then we need a motion. I move that we approve item 15.1, the Capital Adult Education Regional Consortium voting name change. All second. Thank you. So roll call vote, advisory vote, Ms. Clement? Yes. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Pichette. So we have board policy updates. Looks like this is still you. Still me. All right. We have quite a few board policy updates. I will say that we have um, our first board policy is complaints concerning instructional materials. Second is courses of study. Third is sec selection and evaluation of instructional materials. Fourth is supplementary in instructional materials. Fifth is library media centers. Now all five of those have to do with new law that was signed uh, into law in October of 2023. Um, the law is Assembly Bill 1078. So that's just updates to our board policies um, in reference to that law. Uh, number six is our updated board policy on physical education and activity. And I will say this one is one because we are currently, um, Amador County Unified School District is currently in what's called federal program review. Um, and so we have um, our lovely members of the state of California that come out and they review our programming, which is a great opportunity for us because it's, it's kind of this um, assessment they do of our programming to make sure that we're in compliance. So it's opportunities for growth for us. And so one area that they saw was that our board policy of PE and activity, physical education activity was not updated. And so that is why this one is attached. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Just reviewing them, they pretty much all of them are, except for this physical education one, seem to be just updates based on new laws that have been passed. So they're updated that way. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thirty-five years for that, <laughs> for that update. Mm -hmm. and that was probably about the time that the district a consolidated. A <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> consolidated and it was the original policy. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm looking for the marked up one for the PE. I don't see the, is it all new? Well, so, no. Is the blue new? Let, yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> let me explain, because I helped fix this one. So 
Um, there were so many track changes that had we provided you the track changes one, you wouldn't want to even look at it. So it's really marking out the old policy from 1983, completely wiping it clean and putting in the brand new policy because it's it, it was too it was impossible to track change it. Thank you. Right. That is correct. Let's make sure. <laughs> yes. Some of the language is pretty weird. When the student is in any grade 10 through 12 and is excused for up to 24 clock hours in order to participate in automobile driver training. What is that? How do you get excused for 24 hours for driver training? I might be able to answer that. <laughs> being one of the people that's had the credential. Uh, basically, when you did driver training in the car, you had to be driving for six hours. And you had to have so many hours of watching it, being a passenger in the car. Okay. I have no additional questions. If anybody else has, has questions. We need a motion to approve the board policy updates. And can we approve them all? Yes. Okay. So 15.2A. I move that we approve uh, board policy updates 15.2A. All second. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker and Mrs. Parker. Um, the advisory vote? Yes. Thank you. Is Mr. Marzano back yet? No. Okay. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. I'm also a yes. Thank you. Okay, we have a business office policy, management of district assets and accounts. Mr. Critchfield. Yes, this is just a small update to how we, um, to be in compliance with the law with uh, how we account for fiscal updates for our assets and any sort of changes to district assets and how those are tracked and regulated. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't have any questions at this time. Does anybody else? We can always have questions when you present stuff, but <laughs> when you bring a policy that has to do with how we're funded by the state and the timing of those payments, I'm gonna have some questions. Yeah, that, that, that is we not this too. board policy, no. We, we do too. Yes. Yes, I don't miss my chance to ask those questions. Right. Okay, if there are no questions, um, whenever you are comfortable making a motion, please. Um, I'll move to approve item, where are we on? Around 15? 15B. 15B. Oh, I'll second. Thank you. The advisory vote, Ms. Clement? Yes. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. I'm also a yes. I just add one note that it's 15.2B. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, 15.2C, board policy for closed session. Dr. Gibson. This bylaw is, to update, um, is updated to reflect an appellate court ruling in Fowler versus City of Lafayette which clarifies that when an item is agendized in closed session based on the threat of litigation made by a person outside an open meeting and a district official or employee received knowledge of that threat made a, made a record of the statement before the meeting, that statement is required to be made available to the public. The bylaw is also updated to reference the accompanying um, Exhibit 1 for specific agenda descriptions for closed session um, items and accompanying exhi ex Exhibit 2 for descriptions to report out of specific closed session items. Additionally, the bylaws updated to clarify uh, precision and consistency. So we're going to go talk about it in closed session because someone wrote us a letter that they're about to sue us. The letter right. has to be public? Correct. Well, or if we receive just knowledge if somebody verbally says it, then yes. Okay. Interesting. Do you guys have any questions about that? If there are no questions, then we would need a motion for 15.2C. 
I'll move to approve item 15.2C. I'll go ahead and second. Thank you. Student advisory vote, Ms. Clement? Yes. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. I'm also a yes. Thank you. Thank you. 15.3, Career Technical Education Revisions for the 24-25 school year, Dr. Palazuelos. Three, three items. Three items, uh, all interconnected. So thank you, thank you, Board President and Trustees. Um, this particular one is an exciting one. As you well know, in our one of our last board meetings, we talked about the great work happening in career technical education here in Amador County Unified School District. Uh, what's before you is um, an item for your consideration. Uh, first, to reclassify uh, the position of coordinator career technical education to director of career technical education. Uh, the rationale for this is as we looked at what we currently have in the position as coordinator and the ambitious agenda we have moving forward for career technical education, we recognize that it's gonna require a specific skill set and someone that has the abilities and more importantly, the managerial experiences uh, to lead this effort. So that's gonna be number one. Uh, and this is uh, recommending to the board the reclassification of coordinator career technical education to director of career technical education. There are fiscal implications that are included in the item. Uh, first off, with the career coordinator, it is 197 work days, whereas the director of career technical education will be 212. And some folks would say, well, 197 to 212 makes a tremendous amount of difference as we're getting ready to plan, coordinate, and evaluate programs for the future year. Um, there, is, there are cost implications. Uh, with the current salary, salary level at the coordinator level, uh, the range is $95,629 to $107,631. Whereas with the director level, we would start at 111,463 and then uh, up to a maximum of 125,448. Um, these are resources that are restricted to CTE programs uh, coming out of fund one. And uh, with, uh, if there's no other questions, I'd recommend approval of that first item. This is all funded by the CTE grant? 100%. So, Dr. Palazuelos, um, how many days do our teachers, how many days are our teachers doing? 183. So, I think part of our ag incentive grant pays our ag teachers for additional days in Correct. the summertime for fair and stuff. Yes. What does that bring them to for a total number of days for our ag teachers? 203. Thank you, Mr. Critchfield. Thank you, Mr. Critchfield. Just, just curious because... Yeah, when you talk about the increase in the administrator days going all the way up to 212, that it makes me wonder how that compares to how, and I'm sure our, I am positive our ag teachers are working more than. 100% they are. Yeah. Yeah, you get, a, you get a sick project and they're gonna be there as long as it takes to get them better. Absolutely. So. If there are no additional questions, can we get a motion please? I move that we approve the 15-3 the career technical education revisions for the 24-25 school year. I'll second. Thank you. Student advider advisory vote, Ms. Clement? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. And I'm also a yes, thank you. 15.4, Amador County Unified School District audit report. Sounds like a good one, Mr. Critchfield. No, Ms. Dr. Palazuelos expressed excitement. I don't know how many people get excited about audits. Um, this is not a typo. This is the 2021-22 audit. So that is a fiscal year that ended a year and a half ago. Um, we had some challenges. Our auditor firm, Ede Bailey, expressed repeatedly that they were having staffing sh shortages and were not able <coughs> to complete the audit in a timely manner. We communicated with the state controller's office over and over again each time there was a delay. Um, there wasn't any ill will or bad blood. It wasn't anything like that. It was just the fact that they kept expressing to us that they did not have um, the audit team they used to and were not able to complete the audit in a timely manner. So that that's a big part of this because um, this is always an approval by the board that's a little bit unique. Um, the board doesn't get to change this because it already happened. These are 
This is an audit of actuals, of money that has already been spent. And so what we're asking the board to approve tonight is to accept the audit report. Um, once it's completed by the auditors, even though it's, it hasn't come to the board, that has already been turned into the state controller's office. And so what's done is done. Um, there were two small findings. Uh, both have already been remedied. Again, they were, um, I wanna commend my business office team um, led by our fiscal director, Robert Norton, because they had to go way, way back to uh, find some of these financial reports and statements and everything. The, the request from auditors is, is quite intense. And so having to go back during the 23-24 fiscal year as we were closing books on the 22-23 fiscal year and then go look at documents from the 21-22 fiscal year um, could be quite challenging. And, and my team did a great job of not slowing down the process at all, um, even because it was already behind time. And so, um, again, we requested extensions each time and they were granted. And so there are um, no other compliance issues here, but um, the audit report came back uh, very clean and everything's in order from a fiscal year that ended a year and a half ago. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, I commend you and your team, and I know we're always planning a year for next year, dealing with this year, and looking at last year. Correct. You know, it's that continuing cycle. Uh, and I know periodically we uh, go with different auditors so we don't get stuck with the same one, and, you know, they don't think it gets a fresh set of eyes looking at the books and everything. Where are we at in that process? We are in the middle of the request for proposal, so I anticipate at the next board meeting or the one after that to bring to you an agreement for a new auditor firm. And that would be for next, for this current year supposedly? No, 22-23 still has not been audited. So we oh. gotta start with 22-23. Okay. It's always a look back. You don't really yeah. start it until the books are closed. So, yeah. so oh, you, you're you right. fall I, behind I, that I way. I mentioned that, so okay, thank you. So I have a question. At your conferences, do they talk about how um, has it been difficult for auditing firms as a whole or just this one in particular? Oh, no, there are multiple auditing firms that have had issues, and there are numerous districts that are behind on, on, a, on their audits because of that. So what would you major in in college to work for one of these auditing firms? Typically accounting. Oh, yeah. I think your tone kind of says it all. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a personality that <laughs> There's, I don't know very there, there many. Just aren't, there just aren't as many auditors as there used to be. There were, was more competition. Auditing firms had more robust staffing, and it, 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 is, a, it is a need. I, our financial advisors were telling us about a district they're working with that still has not completed their 2020-21 audit, so a year prior to this one that we're referring to. Well, what's the, um, like, salary range looking like for <laughs> like maybe let's look at the good part of that so i like if you were going to go work for an auditor I, like I is, don't know. are they paying more because they can't find them i don't know i spend a lot of my energy on recruiting employees for us not for a private <laughs> auditing firm but oh. i'm not exactly sure julia what they pay i'm in my launching high school graduates era <laughs> i know they charge a lot for an audit so i, I hope they pay well can we get a CTE pathway? <laughs> <laughs> well, you could when I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Gonzo talked about That's a good class. question. Yeah, no, I know where you're getting at, Julia, but yeah. Yeah, it, is, it is, again, it's, you, use a, you have to use an outside auditing firm, so their hiring and employee practices are completely out of our control. And yes, periodically, you don't have to change auditing firms, but every so many years you need to change who the lead auditor is. Um, but it is good practice to, every three to seven years look at changing auditing firms as well and Ed bailey now has done i think this was their third either second or third audit for us we were with crow before that um, and so we do have a few interested parties for auditing firms that have called in i they, we don't have any formal proposals yet but we're, we're fairly early in that process of of looking for a new auditor so it's always an outside company correct? it has to be yes. yes it has to be so yeah. cities also have the same kind of um, best practices where they change their yeah public agencies well. have to go through an external audit and there's there's government codes that cover that right. so the state requires you to have an audit by a third party and then do they make I'm assuming they make us pay for that audit <laughs> correct okay. Oh, <laughs> okay thanks Which brings me back to that they can't hire enough auditors okay 
Um, do we need to approve this, or is this just? You would you would accept the audit report we, would be the so motion. So we need a motion to accept. I motion that we accept item 15-4, the audit report for the 21-22 uh, fiscal year. I'll second. Thank you, gentlemen. For the student advisory vote, Ms. Clement? Yes. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Thank you, Mr. Critchfield. Thank you. Uh, oh, don't go away. I'm Black not going Box anywhere. Network Services proposal. This sounds very good. Yes, so this is just a something that, that needs to happen as, as we see phone vendors change hands on who's in charge, and this is for servicing of our phones. We have over 500 landlines in the district, and so anytime you have that many landlines, you're obviously gonna run into technical issues. Right now, we're in a situation where if there's an issue, we have to do a service call. Without a contract in place, two problems occur. We fall more to the back of the line, um, in those service calls, and then on top of that, we get charged more. So having a service contract in place is best practice. We had one in place with Vox, but they no longer exist, so we're asking that the board approve this service contract so that our maintenance department, who typically handles these service calls, can work directly with Black Box on any of our phone needs. Is, is, it, is the price increasing? Um, from the last agreement, it is a slight increase. I mean, everything's gone up in pricing, but it's not outrageous. Are there any additional questions? It wasn't as fun as I thought it was going to be. I'm sorry. How many, how many uh, other companies were considered for this? Uh, there aren't very many out there that do the volume that we do. We reached out to three, and these were really the only ones that were seriously interested. It's a BCM type system versus I, IP. I know that's internet protocol, but I don't understand the BCM type system. You've stumped. You've stumped me. I do not again. Know. I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> I mean, it's still a phone system that needs to be worked on. So this is why we need black box so they can handle these things for us. Is this a yearly price for that? Like yes. fifteen thousand. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'll move to approve item 15.5, Black, Black Box Network Services Proposal. I'll second. Thank you. The student advisory vote, Ms. Clement? Yes. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Thank you, Mr. Critchfield. Thank you. Uh, we have already completed 15.6, so 15.7. It is our calendar, our board meeting calendar, Dr. Gibson. Yes, we found an error on the calendar where we have a meeting from December meeting when we did the organizational meeting um, for the last uh, week of February, which means we'd have back-to-back -back weeks of board meetings. We went back and just kind of looked to see prior to last year um, what took place at those meetings, and I think we had two or three agenda items. So it's not a meeting that is necessary, so we are asking that we update um, the yearly, regularly scheduled board meeting calendar to delete that Febu that last February board meeting. The other, the other issue, let me also explain that we always run into at that particular meeting, um, as well as sometimes the first March meeting, is we do not have access to this room, which makes it difficult, which means we, no matter what, there's no, it's very difficult or impossible for us to live stream. Is it elections? It's elections, yeah. yeah. So they, they take over this facility for quite some time. Um, we're fortunate they will be out by four o'clock at the first March board meeting, so we're clear on that one, right, Lori? We confirmed that, yeah, that's the one we confirmed. But the, uh, the end of February is a, a hard no, which has always been an issue for us to find a location that um, is suitable. So in past years, I think, too, not every February, but um, right after elections, we will do um, governance trainings um, for our new board members in that late February slot. So, but we're we don't have that. We don't have anybody yes. new right correct. now. So. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Are there any questions about the calendar change? If not, would um, can I get a motion to approve? I move that, sorry. I move that we approve item 15.7, updating the regularly scheduled board meeting calendar for 2024-25. All second. <clears throat> the student advisory vote, Ms. Clement? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. And I'm also a yes. That brings us to 16. So we have reports. Dr. Gibson? 
Um, I don't have a ton to report. I did a site visit um, last week. It was great up at Pioneer. If you haven't been there lately, I, I recommend that you reach out to, to one up to me and I can schedule it for you. It's fun to have some time. It, you know, the snow was on the ground still, so that was fun. Um, but I really want to commend um, Mrs. Horn. She has just been such a, a true team player um, and just does an amazing job as principal um, at that site. So thank you, many thank yous to her. Um, I also just want to do a quick minute and do, and I know she just walked out the door too, darn it, um, for um, Amanda. She has done just a remarkable job in this new position. Um, that the video was fantastic, um, and I really want to commend Mrs. Pichette as well for her leadership over that particular program when she stepped into her role as the assistant superintendent. Um, Mr. Critchfield and I got to take a field trip today to Sacramento with some of his staff, which was fun. Um, I don't usually get to travel with the uh, business office. And uh, we attended the governor's budget workshop. Um, it was quite interesting um, how California budgets our money. Uh, I just feel like if, as a school district, we did that, we would not have jobs, nor should we. Um, and so we are just, you know, we're kind of in this interesting time again with budgets. Not that it's doom and gloom by any means. It's just um, creativity, I guess, is a better word for it. So. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. I think those are the biggies because we just came back from break. Um, I will be doing some advocacy work both at the state capitol as a county superintendent. Oh, I'll talk about that actually at the county meeting, so never mind because that's just my county seat. So now I always have to divide myself. So um, I think that's it for now. Thank you. This is my favorite part of every school board meeting. It's our student updates at the board report section. Ms. Clement. Yeah, I don't have too much to report on because we just got back from break, but we do have quite a few um, upcoming events. So tonight we had Argonaut 101 to like highlight Argonaut's different departments, clubs, and sports teams to the incoming eighth graders and their families. So I wasn't able to make it because of the board meeting, but I'm excited to hear about how that went. Um, and then next Friday we have preview day for the eighth graders. So we like go down to the junior highs um, ride up on the buses with them, and then we have a bunch of fun activities planned, a campus tour, and then a barbecue uh, cooked by our culinary students. So I'm looking forward to that and seeing um, a bunch of new faces. Um, this week is also big game week because we have the basketball big game against Amador on Friday. So we've had spirit days all week, um, and on Friday we have a winter sports rally to highlight um, we have like a winter homecoming court for the underclassmen, so we highlight them, and then we also highlight our winter sports just to get excited about the basketball um, game. And then on Saturday, we have our winter homecoming dance at the Sutter Creek Auditorium, so I know a lot of people are looking forward to that, but that's all I have to report on for now. Thank you. So before I um, move on to Mr. Crow, Dr. Gibson, did you have something to add? I did. I just want to make a quick comment about the community, the consolidation community input meeting that was brought up earlier, so I can address that. Number one, um, because the board meeting was canceled on February 28th, we are holding that night for the next meeting, so that will take the place of that. We will get something out much sooner than we did last time. Um, I just want to do some clarification around that meeting as well, um, as I, I do understand there was some confusion. So that meeting was originally created um, by a group of community members, some for, some not so supportive of consolidation, who had requested us to put together a group. It was really designed originally around getting information and input regarding the name, colors, and mascot. Um, the word kind of got out and some other people reached out. Um, we originally reached out to every agency. We reached out to the Board of Supervisors, to every city council member. Um, there was probably, and I have the whole list that I can I can show you too, but um, that we, all the clubs, we reached out to the tribes, Rotary Club, I mean, you name it, we reached out to um, invite those particular organizations in. Um, we had great turnout the, in September and October. Um, it might have been late September or maybe early November now that I think about it. Um, and then the December meeting was canceled because a bunch of us were sick. Um, this last meeting, unfortunately. So then we opted to open it up a little bit wider, and I greatly apologize that that didn't go out sooner. We will have probably two, maybe three more meetings coming up, um, and those meetings will be scheduled well in advance. We will get that information out. I just want to make it clear that those meetings are not um, designed to come and voice your concern to us 
um, in a way to, in, in, for consolidation not to happen. We wanna hear the concerns, but it's really a dialogue with us. The board is not there. Um, it's with our cabinet team is there. Um, we have other staff members that have volunteered to come to those meetings. Um, and, but we definitely want that input because a lot of the questions that we get from that meeting do help us um, kind of formulate some of the process that we're working on. So I just wanted to clarify that and get that on the record that the next meeting is Wednesday, February 28th. And we'll get that out in the next couple days, I promise. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Mr. Crow, did you have a board report? Yeah, a couple things. Following up with uh, what Tori said on those meetings, um, I think it would be helpful if there was some type of uh, uh, meeting minutes that could be shared. Yes, and we're working on those. Um, we don't, it's not, I also wanna add this great question. It's not a board appointed committee. So it doesn't have to follow Brown Act. It's really kind of a superintendent or um, a cabinet type um, run meeting. So we don't, we do have an agenda. We will send that out. Um, we are recording minutes as soon as I have time to get all those. I have all the minutes, I just have to get them typed up. Um, and we will get those posted right away. Yeah, I just think that's just a, another way to keep the public informed and keep everyone kind of on the same page and not everyone Agreed. wondering what, you know, what, what someone we're doing. said. Yeah. And I think the question came up too about, um, I, I believe to a board member about, you know, us having meetings that aren't open to the public and what people have to, we have meetings every day that aren't open to the public. Um, because they're our job to have meetings. We sat in a meeting on Tuesday all day together, and that's not definitely not open to the public. So if anybody wants to not come the and board. meet with us. No, not board members, sorry. I'm just talking about staff. But you know, if there's anybody who is eager and willing to come and sit and meet with us, any one of us on cabinet will sit down, whether it's educational, whether it's HR, whether it's special ed or facilities, or just the general overall vision of the district, any one of us on the topic are more than happy to meet with anyone at any time that they are available to meet. Um, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, our door is open and we will make time to meet with anybody that has questions or concerns. And yes, I will get those minutes out. Thank you. Um, the other thing is I would like to, um, we had a parent with, I guess it was a young person that, uh, uh, she referenced that um, I would like to see if there's any way that we could, uh, the district can um, provide assistance. We have, here we have a, an example where a student wants to further their education to help their, their continued, uh, you know, towards college. And if there's a way that we could help them, I would, I would like to see if there's a way we can find a solution for them. Yes, and I was planning on reaching out um, to first thing tomorrow. I think... Um, I'm just gonna say that I personally worked on that policy last year and I think it's being misinterpreted um, not to be the way it's supposed to be implemented, which is not being helpful for the students. So I, I plan to reach out probably mid-morning tomorrow, um, kind of with an update for you on that. That's all I have, thank you. Um, I don't have a report at this time. Okay, uh, first of all, I plan on being at the uh, Amador High School on Friday to look at their wellness center and everything, seeing as that came up. Uh, and next Monday, uh, I know that it was sent to all board members because mentioned it, Capital Advisors Group is a, is a uh, group that presents things kind of like school services that you went to this week uh, about their budget thoughts and everything, and they're inviting school board members in and everything. So I'm gonna go and attend and listen to that so I can get some information from it. And if I hear anything good, I will definitely pass it along and everything. So uh, that, that's my report. Um, I would like to remind us all that we have a Brown Act workshop on February 7th coming up. Um, and the reason why I was thinking about the Brown Act was because of the public meeting discussion surrounding the community input meetings. So um, we'll get some clarification on when the Brown Act applies and when it doesn't. Obviously, you have to have a form, a formally um, created committee in order for that to apply. Um, 
February 3rd is a Saturday. We have our county-wide FFA crab feed. And um, if you need the information because you would like to go, please see me after this meeting or get a hold of me. However, I will share that information. It is both high school's FFAs will be at that um, fundraiser. It is their big fundraiser for the year to send those kids off to their conferences that they go to and support both chapters. It is a fantastic evening. Um, I hope to see you there. And Dr. Gibson, thank you for clarifying about the community input um, meeting. I know there were a lot of questions yeah. about that and that late text certainly probably really triggered some of those. So. Um, we are going to do better next time, and we'll get we'll get that notification out sooner. Um, and that I mean that's all we can do is do better. So, right. um, can I make one more statement? <laughs> sure. Sorry, this is the easiest way for me to get information out. Um, I've had many questions this evening via text and via email, and you know all the craziness about um, a message that was posted um, on social media about raises that were possibly given, and that is completely incorrect. Um, there haven't been any raises given. You can go look at any and all of our uh, board packets. Um, pretty much everybody in the district, I wish, oh, Mrs. Jensen is here. Um, and I think it's, it's pretty well known across every school district that um, the teachers union kind of drives that, that um, piece of what happens in a school district. All the other unions or non-union reps, uh, representative um, employees kind of sit back and wait as you know, whatever your teachers union group is works with CTA and they negotiate raises or whatever is happening through um, the negotiations process. Um, and none of that has been settled for this year at this point. We are in the middle of negotiations, um, which she brought up tonight so eloquently, by the way. And um, so I just wanted to make that very clear because the misinformation um, just makes it really difficult. It's, it just causes a little bit of chaos for something that actually did not take place. Um, it would not take place when the board is clear that it didn't. So I just wanted to clear the record on that. Thank you. So our next meeting is Wednesday, February 7th, 2024, tentatively scheduled to be held here at the Amador County Administration Building. Open session will start at 6.30 p.m. We are adjourned. It is 8 o'clock. Do you guys need a break? Do we need to extend the time because you started at 4? No. No. No, I'm gonna give um, Maeve a minute to excuse herself. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. I think. Are you going to the dance? Are you going to the dance? I am, yes. All right, have fun. Saturday, winter formal for Argonaut. It's Twilight theme. Mm -hmm. Twilight. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of rhinestones. Yes, yes, let me pull up the, the next agenda. Okay, we're going to call to order the Amador County <laughs> Office of Education meeting. It is 8.02. I have 8.04, actually. Um, we are in attendance except for Mr. Marzano, um, who is absent. Uh, Dr. Gibson, are there any deletions or corrections to this agenda? No. Excellent. We have no presentations <coughs> and recognitions. Um, no employee recognition. No employee organization representatives. Um, no public <coughs> comment cards. We are to the consent agenda. Did anybody have questions on the consent agenda? If there are no questions, I'm ready for a motion <coughs> to approve. Um, I move to approve item eight, the consent agenda. I'll second. Thank you. For the roll call vote, Mr. Crow? Yes. <coughs> Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. I'm also a yes. We have no communications for tonight um, on the county side. Uh, we have one discussion action item. It is the exciting audit report for 2021 through 2022. Mr. Critchfield. Thank you. 
Yes, so just like on the di at the district meeting, this is the county audit, the same time frame, the 2021-22 fiscal year. Even though we are two, technically two sub separate agencies, as you know, there's only one business office. And so when we, it, our practice has always been when we conduct the audit with the auditors, they're simultaneously working on both audits. There is some interplay between the two agencies, of course, um, as we're inseparably connected. And so um, same issues as I mentioned at the district meeting with staffing shortages with our auditing firm and why they got behind. And um, again, all amicable, just trying to work through the process with them. And so we were able to complete that audit and ask that you accept that. Um, I move to accept um, item 10, the audit report for 21-22. That would be 10-1, and I second the motion. Thank you. Roll call vote. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mrs. Parker? Yes. Mr. Whitaker? Yes. I'm also a yes. Thank you. For information only, we have the current personnel recommendations, and we have the updated board meeting calendar to, co to coincide with the district board meeting calendar. And did you have... Um, does anybody have any questions for either of those? Okay, I know Dr. Gibson has a report for the county side tonight. Yes, I'll keep it very brief. Um, but I am looking forward to the end of February. Um, I will be going to the state capitol with the other single, single uh, superintendents, as well as the president of the California County Superintendents Association to meet with lawmakers, to do more advocacy work um, on a multitude of topics. I'll bring those topics back at a later board meeting. And then um, about a week and a half later, um, going to DC to do the same thing. And our, our biggest push on that is we're finally starting to make some headway um, with lawmakers in regards to pulling up the amount of money we receive in special ed funding um, from the federal government. So. Um, we're, I'm really excited about that and that work that we've been doing as county superintendents. That's it. Thank you. Did anybody um, have an additional report? Okay. Then we are going to have our next meeting on Wednesday, February 7th, tentatively scheduled to be here at the Amateur County Administration Building. Open session will start immediately following the Amateur County Unified School District meeting. We are adjourned. It is 8.08. Thank you, everyone.